boiler's function is to produce large amounts of hot water or steam. So, in order to perform effectively, boilers use an enormous amount of heat. In some boilers, temperatures get so high that they can melt many metals. To contain this heat and to protect certain boiler parts, a special heat-resistant material is used. This material is called refractory. Refractories are non-metallic materials that are difficult to fuse or melt. They make up the furnace lining of some boilers. In other boilers, refractories are placed between the boiler tubes and the casing of the boiler to insulate the boiler from its surroundings. Refractories are used to line ash pits, to form burner rings, and to cover the inside of inspection doors in the boiler. Refractories are also used to protect other equipment that may be exposed to heat or corrosive gases. But no matter where refractories are used, they periodically require repair. There are many different types of refractories, but we'll be concentrating on the most common. We'll see what they're made of, where they're used in the boiler, how they're installed, how they fail, and what maintenance they require. We've divided the common types of refractory into two groups, those that are already shaped and those that can be shaped by the worker during installation. To start, let's take a look at some that are shaped by the manufacturer. Insulating block, insulating brick, and fire brick. Each of these are used to line the walls of some boilers. Typically, there are several layers of refractory in the lining of a furnace. Different refractories are placed together to ensure the most insulation for the least weight and most efficient use of space. The first type of pre-shaped refractory we'll look at is insulating block. Insulating block is made from a material known as diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is soft, lightweight and composed mainly of microscopic shells from marine organism. It's a tough name, but you're likely to hear this term around the plant or see it on packing slips that come with the insulating block. Insulating block is the outermost layer of the refractory wall and is laid without mortar. Insulating brick is the next refractory layer inside the insulating block. Like insulating block, insulating brick is laid dry without mortar, but it's smaller than insulating block. Insulating brick is also made of diatomaceous earth, but often the diatomaceous earth is heat treated to improve the insulating brick's resistance to high temperatures. This heat treatment is called calcination. Insulating brick that is made from this heat-treated material is said to be made of calcined diatomaceous earth. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but you should remember it because you might see or hear it again. Fire brick is used in some boilers to line the part of the furnace that's closest to the fire where the highest temperatures are. Fire brick is made from fire clay, an earthy or stony mixture of minerals that's, that is formed in molds and then dried in a kiln. The fire brick is installed layer by layer in the same way that you lay bricks when building a house. It can protect the insulating brick from direct exposure to flame and hot gases because it's more resistant to damage from high temperature than insulating brick. Since the fire brick refractory is pre-shaped, Specially shaped bricks must be used where irregularly shaped refractory is needed. A special mortar is used to cement that fire brick in place. This special mortar, called refractory mortar, is made from finely ground fire clay mixed with a heat-resistant cement. The refractory mortar is applied to each fire brick by dipping. Sometimes the mortar is applied with a trowel when it's used for repairs. Refractory mortar can also be used to coat the fire side of boiler tubes to protect them from extreme erosion. 
When used this way, the mortar is often thin with water. Now let's look at some common types of refractory that can be shaped. Plastic fire brick, high temperature castable, plastic chrome ore, and chrome castable. An advantage to using this type of refractory is that it can be molded like clay and cast like concrete. Since these types of refractories can be molded, they can be used instead of specially shaped bricks or blocks. Now this is plastic fire brick. The term plastic in plastic fire brick means that the refractory can be molded. It doesn't mean that plastic fire brick is made of the same kind of plastic as your a hard hat, for instance. Plastic fire brick is made from fire clay mixed with water. Plastic fire brick can be used almost anywhere in the boiler, and it's installed by ramming or pounding it into place. Once rammed into place, plastic fire brick keeps its shape. However, it must be fired to set properly. This is done by firing the boiler. Any refractory that is dried by firing the boiler is called a heat setting refractory. The next type of refractory, high temperature castable, is made of hard, dense grains of fire clay mixed with a bonding agent. High temperature castable can be used in areas of extreme heat. Installed by casting it like concrete, it bonds by air drying. High temperature castable develops full strength in 24 to 48 hours without any heating. Plastic chrome ore, sometimes called PCO, is a mined ore made largely of the mineral chromite. PCO is used most often on studded tubes because it sticks to them very strongly. Studs support the PCO and keep it cool enough to prevent it from overheating. PCO is installed by ramming it into place. PCO sets by air drying and then firing it in the boiler. It is a heat setting refractory because it does not reach full strength until heat has been applied. The last refractory type, chrome castable, is made from a mixture of ground chrome ore and a bonding agent. It is also used on studded tubes. It can be installed by tossing it against the studded tubes or by casting it like high temperature castable. Chrome castable develops full strength in 24 to 48 hours without being heated. So, to sum up, the common types of refractories that are already shaped are fire brick, insulating brick, and insulating block. Refractories that can be shaped during installation are plastic fire brick, high temperature castable, plastic chrome ore, and chrome castable. We've discussed what each is made of, where they're used, and how they're installed. Now take a few minutes to review that material in your text. Now we're going to talk about refractory failure. Basically, there are three ways that all refractory can fail. Spalling, cracking, and slagging. Spalling and cracking are caused by changes in boiler temperature or improper refractory installation, or both. Slagging is caused by a chemical reaction. Now, spalling is the flaking and peeling of the refractory through cracks and ruptures at its surface. When refractory spalls, it exposes the inner portions of the refractory, which then spall as well. Spalling is a problem because it makes the refractory thinner, exposing the boiler parts behind it to temperatures higher than they can stand. The result is damaged boiler parts. The spalled surface becomes irregular and may crumble, leaving loose chips and flakes of refractory material on the surface. When this happens, Shallow cracks are left in the surface of the refractory. There are three types of spalling, thermal, mechanical, and structural. Although they look about the same, each has a different cause. Thermal spalling is caused by rapid temperature changes that create unequal expansion or contraction in different parts of the refractory. 
Mechanical spalling is caused by impact, rapid drying, or pressure. A clinker may fall on the refractory and knock some of it loose. Wet refractory can dry too rapidly, resulting in unequal shrinkage and surface flaking. Or, the refractory's expansion from heat can cause it to spall due to pressure from expansion if too little room has been allowed. Structural spalling is caused by uneven texture and composition of the refractory material. This can create zones with different expansion rates inside the refractory. As the refractory is heated or cooled, cracks form between the zones and the surface falls away. This type of spalling can result from improper installation. Uh, for example, if plastic or castable refractory is not thoroughly mixed beforehand. Cracking is another very common problem in refractory. It is caused by heating and cooling of the refractory that cause expansion and contraction. Expansion joints are spaces in a refractory wall that allow thermal expansion to occur without damage. If the expansion joints do not work properly, cracking will result. Now, not all refractory cracks are harmful. When expansion joints do not work properly, some of the cracks that are formed will perform the same function, closing when the refractory is hot, opening when it's cool. You can tell if a crack is doing this by examining it. If the surface inside that crack is clean, not fire blackened or covered with slag, then the crack is closing when the refractory is hot. A crack that closes when the refractory is hot should not be repaired unless the crack decreases the refractory strength, which may cause pieces of refractory to fall off. Normal expansion and contraction will not damage refractory that is properly selected and installed. However, rapid temperature changes can lead to serious failure. Raising the furnace temperature too rapidly is likely to crack the refractory and produce spalling. Lowering the furnace temperature too quickly can produce deep cracks in the refractory. Slagging is deterioration of refractory through a chemical reaction between the ash and the refractory itself. This chemical reaction melts the refractory surface. As the surface melts, it runs off, taking some refractory with it and exposing a fresh layer of refractory to further slag attack. If the slag is not hot enough to melt, it may fall off from a type of spalling similar to structural spalling. Slag and refractory spall because a layer of slag on the refractory has a different expansion rate than the original refractory layer. When temperature changes occur, cracks form between the slagged layer and the rest of the refractory. The slag layer breaks off. This is another form of structural spalling. Slagging can take place in either coal-fired or oil-fired boilers. Coal-fired boilers produce large volumes of ash and slagging takes place when the ash reacts with the refractory. Although oil-fired boilers produce much less ash, there's always enough of it around any boiler to form slag that can damage the refractory. Actually, the most damaging materials found in fuel oil are salts, vanadium salts and sodium chloride, which is common table salt. Both of these salts can form slag if they combine with refractory. Slag caused by sodium chloride looks glassy. It melts and runs over the refractory and it usually causes more damage than any other kinds of slag. The basic cause of all slagging is high temperature. Using the wrong refractory material can make slagging worse. To reduce slagging, select a refractory that is made for high temperature service and is resistant to deterioration from slag. And then, make sure that the correct refractory is properly installed. We've covered three basic kinds of refractory failure, spalling, cracking, and slagging. Remember, temperature change, particularly rapid change, and improper installation are two major causes of refractory failure. Before we talk about repairing the refractory, take a few minutes to review what we've covered so far. Different types of refractories are used in various places in a boiler. 
Selecting the proper refractory for each place is usually done with the help of boiler blueprints. Three characteristics determine a refractory's specific use and location. Strength, resistance to deterioration, and maximum service temperature. Strength is the ability to support weight. Resistance to deterioration refers to the refractory's ability to handle spalling, cracking, and slagging. Maximum service temperature is the highest temperature the refractory can stand before breaking down. When repairing or replacing boiler refractory, the materials used are usually the same as those that were used in the original installation. To determine the original material, refer to the blueprints for the boiler being serviced. Refractory installations differ from boiler to boiler, so be sure to get the right blueprints. The blueprints have important information on refractory material, dimensions, and methods of installation. Now let's take each common type of refractory and go over its three basic characteristics, strength, resistance to deterioration, and maximum service temperature. In some boilers, fire brick is used to line the furnace. Although it has good load-bearing strength, fire brick should not be used to support boiler components like drums or headers. The load-bearing strength is important because if the fire brick is not strong enough to handle the weight, such as the weight of a large brick wall, the wall can collapse. Fire brick's resistance to slagging is only fair. When making repairs, be sure to use the particular kind of fire brick specified in the blueprints. There are several different grades of fire brick available. Refractories are graded by maximum service temperature, and it's important to use the correct grade. Fire brick has excellent resistance to high temperatures and expands very little when exposed to intense heat. Fire brick has a maximum service temperature of up to 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 1,700 degrees Celsius. The refractory mortar used with the fire brick has load-bearing strength as good as fire brick. Its resistance to slagging is only fair. Refractory mortar has a slightly lower maximum service temperature than fire brick. Several kinds of refractory mortar are available, so check your blueprints to find out which kind you should use. Insulating brick backs up the fire brick as the next layer of the wall. The layer of insulating brick must be thick enough to prevent overheating of the outer portions of the boiler wall and casings. Insulating brick is a better insulation than fire brick, but has a lower service temperature. It's also lighter in weight. Its load-bearing strength is less than fire brick, and it has poor resistance to slagging. In a refractory wall, fire brick protects the insulating brick from exposure to excessive temperature and slag. Insulating block is used as the outermost layer of a refractory wall. Insulating block protects the boiler casing from overheating. Less expensive than insulating brick, its insulating ability is somewhat better, but its service temperature is lower. Insulating block is soft and its load-bearing strength is low. Its resistance to slagging is also low. However, it is protected from exposure to slag by the fire brick and insulating brick. Now that we've discussed refractory that comes as brick or block, let's talk about refractory that can be shaped during installation. Plastic fire brick may be used just about anywhere in the boiler, but because of its poor load-bearing strength, Plastic fire brick cannot be used where it must support a lot of weight. Plastic fire brick has excellent resistance to thermal spalling, but it has only fair resistance to slagging. As we've already said, thermal spalling is the flaking away of the refractory surface from high temperature and rapid temperature changes. Plastic fire brick has a maximum service temperature that is slightly lower than fire brick. Plastic fire brick can be pounded or rammed into places that would otherwise need specially shaped bricks, like burner openings or access doors. When repairing plastic fire brick, check your blueprints to see how thick the refractory should be. The boiler must be fired immediately to harden it. Otherwise, the new refractory will shrink and fall out during operation. High-temperature castable can be used almost anywhere in the boiler. 
It is often cast in a form to produce a specially shaped piece of refractory. Like plastic fire brick, though, high temperature castable has insufficient load bearing strength to be used to build a wall that must support its own weight. It's often used in place of plastic fire brick in repairing areas of the boiler because it reaches full strength in 24 to 48 hours without being fired. High temperature castable is used to repair damage to the furnace wall when you know that the boiler will not be fired right away. High temperature castable has only fair resistance to slagging. High temperature castable has the same maximum service temperature as plastic fire brick. It has good resistance to thermal spalling, but not quite as good as plastic fire brick. Plastic chrome ore, or PCO, is typically used on studded tubes. Its load bearing strength is low, but its resistance to slagging is fairly high. PCO must be air dried and then fired immediately, otherwise it will crack and fall out. The maximum service temperature for plastic chrome ore is as high as 3300 degrees Fahrenheit or 1815 degrees Celsius. But despite its relatively high maximum service temperature, plastic chrome ore has poor resistance to thermal spalling. Now this isn't a problem on stud tubes since the studs on the stud tubes keep PCO cool enough to prevent thermal spalling. Still, PCO should not be used in burner openings or for repairs to the furnace walls where the tubes are not studded because it can't be kept cool enough in these areas. If PCO is used in your boiler, the blueprints will show where it's used and the size of each area. Chrome castable refractory is also used on studded tubes. Its load bearing strength is low and it has good resistance to slagging. Chrome castable is subject to thermal spalling. It's air setting, meaning it will set without being fired. Chrome castable refractory is used when it's impossible to properly bake plastic chrome ore, which is not air setting. The maximum service temperature for chrome castable is the same as plastic chrome ore. Check your boiler blueprints before choosing chrome castable refractory for a particular job. We've gone over some common types of refractories and discussed each one in terms of its strength, resistance to deterioration, and maximum service temperature. These three factors are important to know when choosing refractory. Always check your blueprints to see what kind of refractory should be used in areas of your own boiler. Remember, Many things are considered when refractories are specified in your blueprints. The refractory's weight, cost, insulation requirements, and ability to withstand heat and resist wear. That's why blueprints are your best guide to choosing the proper refractory. Now take a few minutes to review the material we've covered so far. What we're going to do now is take a look at how a refractory wall is constructed. To do this, we're going to build a section of a typical boiler wall on this mock-up. The procedure we'll follow is a fairly common one. Though it's not the only one, it will give you a basic idea of how a refractory wall is built, as well as help you understand what's involved in refractory repair. Since we'll be working with refractory, we must take the proper safety precautions. Hard hats, eye protection, filter mask, and other safety equipment may be required. Gloves are especially important, since some refractory material is so abrasive that it can remove the skin on your fingers. If we have to use air-driven tools, we'll need full face and ear protection. Before starting, the blueprints are checked for information about dimensions, materials, and methods of refractory installation. Also, your work area should be as clean as possible. Okay, let's get to work. For this demonstration, this model represents the boiler casing. Insulating block is used to form the first layer of the wall just inside the casing. It's laid with the length of the block in the horizontal position. The widest face is put against the casing. Insulating brick forms the next layer of the wall, just inside the insulating block. Here, it's laid in a staggered pattern with the brick in a vertical position. 
To achieve a staggered pattern, you'll have to cut some insulating bricks in half. These half bricks will be used in the bottom row. We'll begin laying insulating brick at the expansion joint. As we've said, an expansion joint is a space in the refractory wall that allows for thermal expansion. The space is only found in the fire brick portion of the refractory wall, which we'll build in a few minutes. The position of the expansion joint will determine where to lay the insulating brick. To show you how this is done, we'll take a look at how an expansion joint is put together. Here you see an expansion joint in the fire brick. Behind the expansion joint is more fire brick. It's there to protect the rest of the refractory wall from direct exposure to hot gases from the furnace. The fire brick behind the expansion joint must be placed so the expansion joint falls in the center of the brick. But before you can install the first fire brick, you've got to know where the expansion joint is located. The location is usually found by checking the refractory blueprints. In our model, the expansion joint will be here. First, a fire brick is placed so the expansion joint is in the center. Then, the rest of the bottom row is laid using insulating brick. Alternate half and full bricks to produce a staggered pattern. The second row is laid using all full bricks. Once you've built two rows of insulating brick, you can begin the next layer of the wall. That layer is made up entirely of fire brick. Fire brick forms the innermost layer of the refractory wall. The brick is usually laid horizontally against the insulating brick. Fire brick requires mortar. The dry mortar should be thoroughly mixed. This is because the different materials in the mortar may have separated during moving and storage. The consistency of the mortar is extremely important. Following directions on the bag, use enough clean water with the mortar to make a thick, soupy mix. The proper mortar consistency must be maintained during the job by adding more dry mortar or water as required. Stir the batch often. Once the mortar is ready, dip one end of the brick into the mortar. Then, with a wiping motion, dip in the bottom of the brick. Lift the brick and allow excess mortar to drip off. The mortar should stick evenly over the surface of the brick. Do not spread mortar on the brick because this will make the joints between bricks too thick. Quickly place the brick in position and push it hard against the next brick in the course. Then tap the brick firmly sideways and backwards, forcing it into position. The mortar should be thin enough to be squeezed out of the joint. When no more mortar can be forced out of the joints, use a trowel to strike off the extra mortar until it's even with the face of the brick. The thickness of the joints may vary depending on the smoothness and uniformity of the bricks. However, the joint thickness should never be more than one sixteenth of an inch or one and a half millimeters. The fire brick is laid outward from the expansion joints so that the joints between the fire bricks do not line up with the joints between the insulating brick behind them. Here, a plywood spacer is used to form the expansion joint. The blueprint should show if the first course of fire brick is started at the expansion joints with a full brick or a half brick. Half bricks can be bought or cut from full bricks. One way to cut a full fire brick is to strike it sharply at its center. This will cause the brick to crack in half. Before we lay more fire brick, we must install another row of insulating brick. You may have to trim some of the insulating bricks so that their joints don't line up with the fire brick joints. This is done by estimating where the fire brick joint at the top of the insulating brick will be. If the joints will line up, the insulating brick must be trimmed to prevent this. When laying insulating brick or block, make sure there are no openings between the bricks. 
If a brick or block is warped, it should be rubbed flat with a wood rasp or by rubbing it against a fire brick. If they must be cut, this can be done with a hacksaw blade. Once you lay the row of insulating brick, you can go back to laying fire brick. Continue laying fire brick until the insulating brick is almost covered. Then alternate laying insulating brick and fire brick until the wall is complete. Sometimes the fire brick portion of a wall will have special bricks called anchor bricks. An anchor brick is a fire brick with a notch cut in it. A piece of metal called an anchor hooks into the notch and holds the refractory wall against the casing. Whenever possible, furnace walls should be repaired instead of replaced. This will save time and money. Don't make the decision just by the way the fire brick looks. You can't always tell how badly fire brick is damaged just by looking at it. Walls that look like they're badly slagged and spalled may really have hundreds of hours of service left. On the other hand, a wall may look okay, but be dangerously thin from slagging and spalling. The only way to really know the condition of a furnace wall is to measure the wall thickness at its thinnest point. Usually, this can be done at an expansion joint. Sometimes, though, you'll have to remove a fire brick from the worst area and measure its thickness. When a wall has deteriorated to the point where its original thickness has been decreased by one-third, there's a danger of casing overheating. Another danger with thinning is that the furnace wall can weaken and collapse. A dangerously thin wall should be replaced immediately. If you think that the wall might become dangerously thin before the next time it'll be available for repair, immediate replacement should be considered. It's not necessary to replace an entire wall if thinning is confined to one area. Bricks can be removed from the bad area by using a chisel. Remember, wear eye protection and other required safety gear when this is done. Ear protection is also required if air-driven equipment like a compressed air chisel is used. The brick should be removed in the shape of a Christmas tree. By using the Christmas tree method, the weight of the structure above the damage area is transferred down without affecting the soundness of the wall. It may be necessary to remove more than just the damaged section, but no matter how many bricks are removed, there's no danger of falling brick as long as the Christmas tree shape you cut is only one brick wide at the top. Doing brickwork isn't easy, and it's usually not a one-man job. Before starting the brickwork, make sure you have your materials, know the procedures, and have the people needed to do the job well. And follow your safety manual. Well, there's our refractory wall. Now that you've seen how to build a wall, it's time to show you how to patch a wall that's already built. There are other ways to repair a refractory wall than the Christmas tree patching we've already covered. When a wall isn't going to be rebricked, all holes and damaged spots should be patched. There are two types of refractory used to make a patch, plastic and castable. Making patches with either type will prevent damaged areas from getting worse. Whenever possible, the existing fire brick should be undercut. Undercutting is the process of cutting away the fire brick from inside the wall so that a ledge is formed. This ledge makes the fire brick support the patch and prevents it from falling into the furnace. As we said, there are two types of refractory used to make a patch, plastic and castable. Right now, we're going to talk about plastic refractory. Plastic refractory can be either plastic fire brick or plastic chrome ore. We'll work with plastic fire brick first. Plastic fire brick comes ready to use. Its container should not be open until you are ready to use it. Any unused portion should be resealed in its container. Don't expose any more plastic fire brick to the air than can be used in a short time or it will dry out. And don't start a repair unless you'll be able to fire the boiler immediately to set the plastic fire brick. Plastic fire brick that has been in storage a while may not have the same workability throughout. This can be corrected by mixing it up. 
If the plastic refractory is a bit too dry, sprinkle water into it while you're mixing it. Plastic fire brick that already has too much water in it, or is too soft for installation, should be cut into small pieces and allowed to dry slowly. But don't heat it. Heat will cause the plastic fire brick to set. After mixing the plastic fire brick, cover it with a damp cloth. Keep it covered until just before putting it in place. This prevents the fire brick from setting before it's installed. Be careful not to mix in any dirt or other materials with the plastic fire brick. There are several important preparations for plastic fire brick repair. First, remove the damaged fire brick. Remember to wear your safety gear when this is done. If possible, undercut the fire brick. This provides a place where the plastic can hold. Next, clean out the area to be repaired and check to make sure that the insulating bricks are in good condition. If they aren't, they must be repaired with plastic fire brick or replaced with another brick. Finally, make sure if there are any anchors in the area being patched, they are okay. Anchors will have to be dipped in paraffin wax or some other substance that will burn away when the boiler is fired. This gives the anchors room to expand after the plastic fire brick is set. Just before starting the repair, brush out the hole and sprinkle the surrounding fire brick with water. This will make the plastic fire brick bond to the old fire brick more strongly. Once you've completed these preparations, install a horizontal layer of plastic fire brick at the bottom of the area you're filling. Put fist-sized lumps of material in place and ram each lump before putting in the next lump. The plastic fire brick should be rammed into place with a hammer. Ram straight down or at a very slight angle toward the casing. Do not ram directly at the casing. This can damage the insulating brick and block. Ramming directly at the casing can also cause vertical layers in the plastic fire brick. Cracks can form between the vertical layers. Sections of the wall will then drop off. This is why plastic fire brick is installed in horizontal layers. When plastic fire brick is put in horizontally, cracks between the layers will not make the wall fall apart. Always use horizontal layers that are the correct thickness. Ram the horizontal layers with vertical strokes. The service life of the installation will depend on this ramming. At the top of a patch, the fire brick gets in the way of the ramming. To perform the ramming at the top, Build the plastic fire brick out from the wall. This will allow you to ram vertically. The excess plastic will be removed after ramming is complete. Always ram a little more plastic fire brick than you really need. Then, after the whole installation has been rammed, it should be scraped to the proper thickness. Next, roughen the entire surface with a stiff wire brush. Push the brush into the refractory surface. This is called stippling. Don't brush along the surface. Brushing along the surface not only removes material, but it won't help dry the refractory the way stippling does. Stippling is done to allow moisture to escape. After the surface is stippled, vent the plastic fire brick every one and a half inches. To do this, plunge a rod 3 16 of an inch in diameter through to the insulating brick. In metric units, the rod should be one half a centimeter in diameter and should be plunged into the refractory every four centimeters. The vent holes should always be perpendicular to the casing. Plastic fire brick is vented to allow heated moisture to escape rapidly. If moisture gets trapped in the plastic, steam is generated as the furnace temperature increases. The steam pressure then blows pieces out of the wall. Venting also lets heat penetrate deeper into the body of the plastic. This increases the plastic strength. After the plastic fire brick is vented, the patch is fully installed, but the job isn't over yet. Plastic fire brick should be heat dried immediately after installation. Before this is done though, get everything out of the boiler and prepare the boiler for firing. Be sure to observe the necessary safety precautions. Once the boiler is ready, heat drying can begin. This is done by the boiler operator. Drying starts off with a small fire for about six hours. 
Then the furnace temperature is increased over the next six hours until it reaches its maximum temperature. Final firing at the maximum temperature is kept up for another six hours. If possible, the final firing is at the boiler's full power rating. Plastic fire brick can't develop its full strength unless it's fired at a high temperature for at least four hours. After the final firing, the boiler should be cooled down and the new plastic fire brick should be inspected. Any large cracks should be filled with more plastic fire brick. We've now demonstrated the use of plastic fire brick. We've seen the preparations needed before repairs can be made, and then how to repair refractory by using plastic fire brick. Read over the material on plastic fire brick in your text and work out any questions with your instructor. We've just seen how plastic fire brick is used for refractory maintenance. There's another type of plastic refractory that may also be used in a boiler, and that's plastic chrome ore. Plastic chrome ore, or PCO, is installed most often on studded tubes. For our demonstration, we'll use this mock-up of a studded tube wall. Let's take a look at how PCO is installed. PCO comes ready to use. It's important not to heat it or add any material to it before it's used. A small amount of liquid will sometimes separate during shipment and storage. This liquid should be thoroughly mixed back into the PCO. If the PCO has dried out and has a hardened crust, it should not be used. So don't try to save it by adding water. Instead, the hardened crust may be cut off and thrown away. Any PCO that was opened but not used quickly should be put back in its container and resealed. Before you install PCO, make sure that the studded tubes are dry, clean, and free of loose particles. The PCO must be laid in horizontal layers. Place it in position by hand and ram it with a mallet. The finished surface should be flush with the tips of the studs. The ramming must produce a dense structure around the tubes and around the studs from base to tip. If too little is applied, don't add more until the old surface has been roughened with a wire brush. If too much has been used, don't continue ramming with the mallet. Cut off the extra PCO with a trowel and refinish it with the mallet. PCO should be solidly rammed to produce a dense fill, but should not be over rammed. Signs of over ramming are surface sponginess, and liquid rising to the surface of the refractory. Over ramming makes refractory more likely to spall. After you finish ramming, stipple the entire surface with a stiff wire brush. It isn't necessary to vent plastic chrome ore. Once the patch is in place, it must be air dried. The refractory should be air dried for 24 hours before it's fired. This gives any moisture trapped in the PCO time to evaporate. The next step is to clear everything out of the boiler and prepare it for firing. Before continuing, make sure that the boiler is safe to fire. Then, the PCO is heated using a light fire for about four or five hours. If only a small patch has been installed, it does not have to be air dried. However, a light fire should still be used for four or five hours if possible. That finishes our demonstration of how to use plastic chrome ore. Take some time now to review the procedures in your text and clear up any problems you might have. There are two kinds of castable refractories that we'll talk about now. High temperature castable and chrome castable. We'll begin with high temperature castable. To demonstrate how high temperature castable is used, we'll show you how it is cast in a form. The form in this case is made up of a board, which is covered with tar paper, and a metal frame, which is placed on top of the board. This particular form is used to make an insert for an inspection door. High temperature castable comes dry in bags, and the dry material should be thoroughly mixed up before it's used. Be sure to wear the proper safety gear when this is done. 
A filter mask is particularly important. Mixing the dry refractory creates a lot of dust and breathing this dust is not good for you. Once the dry material is thoroughly mixed, add water and continue to mix until the refractory is thick and soupy. Directions for mixing with water are usually on the bag or on a tag attached to it. High temperature castable refractory should be used within 30 minutes after mixing. Any castable that can't be installed promptly may partially set and should be thrown out. Don't mix partially set refractory with water. If partially set material is used, it will weaken the refractory. The next step is to coat the inside of the form with oil. This is done to make the form easy to remove when the refractory has hardened. Next, the refractory is put in the form. It may be poured in or shoveled in, as you see here. Fill the form completely so that there are no air pockets or open spaces. To help work any air pockets out of the refractory, wrap the sides of the form with a hammer. Then tamp the surface with a board, as you see here. The surface of the refractory should be smooth and flush with the top of the form. Then the refractory is left in the form for at least 24 hours. After 24 hours, the form may be removed. Once the form is off, the refractory can be inspected for air pockets or holes. If any air pockets are found, roughen the surface inside the hole and fill the hole with high temperature castable. The finished piece should be air dried for at least another 24 hours before it's installed in the boiler. If possible, dry it even longer. High temperature castable will get stronger the longer it's air dried before heating. The last type of refractory we're going to talk about, chrome castable refractory, is also an air drying material, but it's used on studded tubes. We'll demonstrate its use on this mock-up of a studded tube wall. Make sure that the area you're working in is as clean and dry as possible. Chrome castable refractory is supplied dry in bags and must be mixed before using it. Thoroughly mix the dry refractory to make sure you have an even distribution of all the ingredients. Remember to wear a filter mask when you're working with chrome castable. Next, add water to the dry refractory and mix it in. You should only mix the amount you'll actually install in an hour. Add enough water to get the consistency of plaster. You know you have the right consistency when some of the refractory can be tossed against a wall and it sticks without slipping. If the refractory sags, the mixture is too wet. A small amount of dry chrome castable refractory mixed into the batch will correct this. This material has a bonding agent that makes the refractory set when it's exposed to air. If it starts to set before application, full final strength cannot be reached. Because of this, start working as soon as the consistency of the mixture is right. Then continue the job without stopping until it's finished. Chrome castable refractory is applied to the stud tubes by hand until the required thickness is built up. It must be forced in around the studs, filling all the spaces. The finished surface should be smooth and flush with the stud tips. Too much smoothing should be avoided because smoothing tends to trap moisture inside the refractory. But the surface should not be stippled. It isn't necessary to vent chrome castable refractory because it will be air dried. It will achieve full strength in 24 to 48 hours. The boiler may be fired any time after 48 hours. Long storage without firing after installation won't hurt the refractory. If the refractory needs patching after some time in service, remove all the old refractory from the area to be patched. Enough must be removed so that at least one row of studs is exposed on each side of the repair area. Then, after you wire brush the tubes and studs clean, apply the new refractory. That completes our demonstrations of how to use castable refractory. By now you should be familiar with the types of refractory, why each is used, and how to use them. Remember, all boilers are built differently and all have their own special needs. You may need to refer to your boiler's blueprints to determine what these needs are. Also, don't forget to follow the rules in your safety manual. 
Safety precautions are a high priority in any work you do. Take some time now and go over any problems or questions you might have.